Uh, but while we're getting there this morning, I want us to continue to remember uh, that this is a, a very important month for Sister Myers and I. And I've said this through the years, but Gray Street uh, gets out pretty, they get out pretty easily on this, this deal. And the reason is, is because Sister Myers and I, uh, we started dating on October the 12th. And, uh, of course, it was a few years later, but we got married on October the 16th. Well, if we could have, we were trying to make all them dates, I don't know, just we were trying to be cool about it. You know, we were young and full of hot sauce and all that. But her birthday is October 13th. Mine is October 15th. And uh, so we were thinking what we were going to do is since we started dating on the 12th, the 13th, and my birthday was the 15th, we were going to get married on October the 14th. So we'd have been 12, 13, 14, 15, but we couldn't make it work because we were all the way in another state, and they can understand this. And so we were trying to get it all worked out, and so finally we just decided on October 16th. What I'm telling you is, is you guys get to knock out pastor uh, birthday, pastor wife birthday, and the anniversary all in one week, and this is once and done. So we're all good. Praise the Lord. Now let's get back to having church. You know what I mean? Uh, but we want to say thank you because, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of challenges still ahead of us. But uh, here a while back, the church had put together and raised the funds for us to be able to go on a little vacation. And uh, we're supposed to be going to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And so uh, we're really thankful for you guys doing that. We want you to continue to pray for our health as we go on this trip and that everything will go smoothly, and we'll actually be able to enjoy it. I don't want any hindrances to be able to enjoy it, so it was worthwhile for all the work and labor that you guys put into making this thing possible, and I want to say thank you for that. So what that means is is that Sister Myers and I will be gone for uh, a few days, and uh, we I've got a special uh, guest speaker that I believe will be a great encouragement to you, there are certain people in your life that can come along that they may not be a big-name preacher or a big-name speaker or a well-known somebody across the globe, but they're at, they're at a place or a pivotal place in your life that kind of inspires you and does something to help you, and they encourage you, and you feel a connection with them. Does anyone know what I mean by that? You ever had someone just feel a, a connection with? And this person I felt a great connection with, and I have for several years, very sweet-spirited person. Um, and I am looking forward to them ministering here at Gray Street. I believe they're going to be a great blessing to you, and I wouldn't want to miss it if I were you. Matter of fact, I'm really kind of disappointed that we won't be here, but, um, but what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to work this thing out so that next week Pastor Myers will be preaching Sunday morning, and then we'll either leave then, depending on how things go, how we're feeling. We'll probably either leave that afternoon or the following day, and we're going to go up, we're going to try to split our trip up. I've got some back issues, so we're, uh, riding in a car for 9, 10 hours just didn't uh, as doable as it was when I was 30 years old. Uh, so we'll break the trip up, and we'll probably stay somewhere halfway in a hotel, just take our time getting up there. And that's what a vacation is supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to enjoy it and relax. And then we'll go on up there, try to spend some time up there, find a little stuff to piddle around and do, and uh, relax Spending time together, which is one of our favorite things to do anyway in life. Uh, you, you won't have, I mean, there are times we probably get on each other's nerves, but there's not too much thing that I think we enjoy better than just being together. We really do. And so we're going to spend time together, and then the following Sunday that will be a part of that week, uh, we'll have someone filling in here, and unless something changes, uh, we, we will not be here for that Sunday service. What I'm going to ask you to do is please do me a favor. Don't leave me hanging. Uh, this has happened before, and it's always an embarrassment. I mean, if you look around, we already don't have as many people as we have in the past. And so please do me a big favor. Uh, we've got somebody coming to preach. Don't, don't leave them pre uh, preaching to four people. You know what I mean? They'll say, well, I'd love to hear Brother Myers preach, and he's not going to be here, so I'm not going to come. So if you're physically able, mentally able, I want you to try to be here because uh, this is your church, and you're not supporting it just when I preach. You should be supporting it because this is where God wants you to be. All right? Please? Is that fair? So please do keep that in mind. I want you to pray for God to give us a safe trip. 
And as I mentioned earlier, because we're online now, is that right, Brother Danny? Everything should be firing on all cylinders. Um, to the online crowd, those of you that have been reaching out to us continually, uh, just want to say thank you from the bottom of our heart. Uh, I was telling somebody yesterday, uh, some of you may not get this, but because the last couple of months that Pastor Myers hasn't worked, I've done, I think, one job myself since we came back from Georgia. Anybody remember when we preached revival? And uh, back before then, we were doing several jobs a month. Somehow or another, we have made it to right now, and our bills are paid because we have people that we don't even know, people we never met, uh, that follow us online in ministry, uh, strangers. And uh, some of those folks have sent a little money here and there, and that's the only reason, by God's grace, that we made it this far. And I want to say this morning, if you're one of those people that reached out and helped us to help get this far, I want to say thank you from my heart and our family. You're the reason why we had groceries. You're the reason why that we had gas to put in our car. You're the reason why that we could pay our electric bill. Had it not been for you, um, where would we be? Uh, because we just haven't had much. Sister Myers has had to take off several days because of tests and things of that nature for her work. So her checks have not even been what they normally are. She doesn't work but three days a week when she's on schedule. So can somebody say thank the Lord with me that God has people that love you enough or compassionate enough to see you in your time of need and are willing to do something about it. I just don't know where we would be. So thank you, thank you. If you're one of those, thank you. If you're one of those that said, Pastor, I would have done more if I had more, but I prayed for you, we want to thank you too because it might have been God answered your prayer and sent somebody that did have money, amen, that helped us to get to this point. But here's what I want us to continually pray as we move forward this morning. I want this church to pray that God can fix whatever it is that hinders Pastor Myers because I want to get back to where I was. If I never get back to that place, I'm still going to give whatever I've got. But I just, it is, if you've ever been here, it is miserable when you know what you're capable of and you just physically cannot do it. It drives, it's maddening. It is. So I want you to pray for that. All right? If you got your Bibles this morning, we're going to turn all the way back to the very beginning of the book of Genesis. And I'm going to share with you what the Lord has ordained for this particular service. Amen. I'm going to share with you what the Lord has put in your pastor's heart. All of our online followers, God bless every single one of you. We've got a lot of folks dealing with so much. Right now, I've got friends of mine right now whose father is um, on a ventilator, and they've already called the family in. Word was, I said, that uh, his lungs are basically turned into like concrete, and there's really, it's in the Lord's hands, and if something don't turn around, he ain't going to make it. And so my heart goes out to every one of you that are going through crisis right now. We love you, Gray Street. And I try to pray for different people, and they may never know I'm praying for them, but God knows, and that's what matters. Genesis chapter 21, Genesis 21, and um, if I can, if you'll allow me to pull this thing down into first gear and just kind of uh, plug along for a little bit, uh, share with you in a way that can be edifying to you, I sure would like to do that. Genesis 21, and we're going to begin with verse number 14, Genesis 21. And verse number 14. Sister Myers, can you grab me a water out of my leather bag? It may be in the sound booth. I'm not sure. We're going to read our text here this morning and uh, starting with verse 14. It said, And Abraham rose up early in the morning. And took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the child sent her away, and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off as if it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death 
of the child. Can you imagine being a mom and feeling that way about your son? Lord, please don't let me see my kid die. So she sat over against him, the Bible said, and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. Look at verse 19. Have you got your eyes on it? Let's look at it very carefully. And God opened her eyes. God opened her eyes. And she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. One minute, she's out of water. The Bible said the water in the bottle was spent. And the next thing you know, there's a well, and she's making her way to the water to fill the bottle back up. With God's help, I'd like to preach this message in a very sensitive time that many of us are dealing with. And I've been telling the church that some of the very things that God has allowed me to experience, I want to transfer them to you because I believe that through it you can be encouraged. But with the Lord's help, I'd like to preach on when you're out of water. When you're out of water. Would you raise your hand to the Lord and let's begin to pray. Father in heaven, we are living amongst a very difficult time for a lot of people. I'm praying, God, that in this difficult season of life for so many, that you'll bring compassion and love, mercy, understanding, and wisdom. God, renew courage within those who have lost courage and hope within those that have lost hope. And I pray, God, that you'll strengthen us, the very foundation of our salvation. Strengthen us as a whole. Let our minds be solid and clear, thoughts be clear, and we'll give you praise for all that you accomplish in Jesus' name, and you may say amen. You may be seated. Preaching this morning on a subject, I've preached from this text before, but I've never preached it this way. I've never had the Holy Ghost lay it on my heart like this, but I want to talk to you about when you're, when you're out of water. Now, I know this morning that for some of us, you already know this story, and you know it very well. Not everybody does, so I may take some time to preach this out, but just as a general overview of the story, when I look at it, I see that this text, for me at least, it is a reminder this morning that Sometimes the circumstances and things that we go through in life, they don't feel, sometimes they don't seem fair. For me, I feel like sometimes it's the elephant in the room in Christianity because we like to talk about the moves of God, the prayers being answered, great things happening. But what do you do when you've been praying for somebody who's been on a ventilator and they die? What do you do when you've been praying that a loved one gets off drugs and they die of an overdose? What do you do when you've been praying and you've been hoping that things will get better in your marriage and your husband files for divorce? What do you do in those situations? It's that elephant in the room, if you will, that a lot of people just don't want to address because it's so easy for us to talk about the God on the mountain. It's not easy to talk about where God is sometimes in the valley because a lot of times in life, believe it or not, even the most dedicated Christians may have had times in their walk with God and they say, Lord, this does not seem fair. This does not feel fair. Is there anyone humble enough to admit you've ever kind of felt that way within yourself? If you look at the story of Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac and Abraham, 
and you realize what went on, and we'll get more into that, just on the surface you would understand this morning, praise God, that Sarah doesn't, it may not seem fair for Sarah because for Sarah, she's the one that's barren. Sarah is the one that cannot have a child up until this point. And so it may seem unfair to Sarah that she feels the necessity to allow her husband to be with their servant or slave or handmaid, however you want to look at it, so that they can fulfill what she feels like is the plan of God. Most of us that know the story, we already know the tail end, and we see, so we knew it wasn't the ultimate plan of God to bring forth Isaac because Isaac was to be the promised son, but Sarah got ahead of God thinking she's doing the right thing, and I want you to know this morning, it's very easy to think you're doing the right thing within yourself, and you make plans, and you think you're going to fix it, and you end up with an Ishmael instead of an Isaac. But that didn't mean that God wasn't going to bless Ishmael. Somebody say amen. But for her, it felt as though probably for Sarah that it was unfair. It doesn't seem right. I mean, I am the wife. I am Abraham's wife. Why should I have to stoop to that level? Why can't God just bless me and give me the baby? You know, but see, she was also wrestling with the fact that she's way up in her age. I mean, when you get that old, one preacher said, you do good to hold a baby, let alone have a baby. That's how old she was. But then you look at it on the other hand. Here's Hagar. She's the handmaid, the slave, the one that's working around the house, the one that caters to their every need. And for her, I'm sure it didn't seem fair when things began to fall apart because Sarah and Isaac get to stay there with Abraham. And the Bible uses the terminology talking about casting out the bondwoman, casting out this, this, this handmaid, casting out this slave out of the house. When you use the terminology in old history, you would understand that terminology refers to in, in such cases of divorce, serious of casting out. When they say casting out, when we talk about uh, getting rid of demons, we say casting them out. And so this is a very serious implication, and I can only imagine that Hagar probably herself felt as though that it was unfair. Why does my son got to leave and Isaac gets to stay? Why do we got to leave this house? I mean, this doesn't make any sense to me. I'm sure that she probably thought, what's wrong with my son and so right about Isaac? What's so bad about Ishmael and so good about Isaac? I mean, there's a lot of things that may have gone through the mind of this woman but they've got to leave this place that they have known since this child was born. Now, historically, if you do any study, and this is why study of the Word of God is so imperative and important. When you read the text, it almost sounds like that Ishmael is a baby. There are several things that make it sound like that Ishmael's a baby. But historically and chronologically, there's no way that Ishmael could have been a baby or an infant at this time because of when the time was that Ishmael was born based on and versus the time that Isaac was born. Most put Ishmael somewhere around the age of about 16 to 17 years old, and they put Isaac at somewhere around the age of three years old by the time he's born. So we see that when Abraham is told to cast out this woman, this bond woman and her son. He's around the age of 16, 17 years old. They have spent the last 16 or 17 years as Abraham being his father. He's known this man as being his father. Now he's got to leave. Now he's got to go out on his own. Him and the mom's got to go as if, you know, goodbye, adios, we don't want you here. And I, I, I want you to understand that in all honesty, this is one of the hardest things that you'll grapple with as a child of God, 
that when you feel that you're doing everything that God wants you to do, and yet you come through an unfair feeling season where it seems like your circumstances don't really make a lot of sense, and it feels like maybe God may be angry with you. And, and, and the reason that I feel like we grapple with that, and it's so hard to understand why are my circumstances, why do they feel so off and out of balance and out of whack when I'm doing everything I can to serve God? Because when I look over my shoulder to the left and the right, the hypocrite and the God-haters are prospering, and I'm over here dealing with sickness in my body. My husband's got issues, and why is it that we've been faithful in tithes and offering all these years and faithful to a church and worked in a children's church class, and why would we be going through this? I mean, I, I mean, surely God understands that we've done everything we can to be faithful to God all of these years, and why us? Why now? Why this? It don't make sense. I mean, why, God, it seems so unfair, and if anybody has ever been human enough to admit that you've gone through that place of whys and why not, will you say amen to me this morning? But I want you to see, I cannot assign to you today that Hagar or her son Ishmael are somehow innocent that they've never done or void of any error in this story. As a matter of fact, there are details that you and I would miss we didn't live 16 or 17 years in that house uh, seeing what went on during the course of events. It is believed by many in history and through commentators and such that Ishmael may have in some ways uh, mocked at this new son. And we read in the text where that, that would, would make possible sense. We also read that there was a tension between Sarah and Hagar. Some preachers have preached it like this and made it sound as if, and I don't know because I wasn't there, but some have preached it and made it sound as if that, that when, when Hagar had Ishmael, that all of a sudden she feels this new sense of empowerment that she's able to do what Sarah cannot do. And maybe there was a sense of arrogance in the household. We don't know 100%. But there's tension nonetheless. And so I don't want to make Abraham and Sarah out to be villains because in the greater scope of this, I want you to remember throughout this preaching this morning that God's hand was in the whole thing. That like Sister Meyer said, that sometimes God's will is not comfortable. God's will may not make us feel happy within our flesh, in our human flesh. But when we take a step back and we see the greater scope of what God's doing greater and farther down the road, we can see the handiwork of God and know that we can give God praise even when it feels like that we're going through an uncomfortable time. Can someone say amen? But you see, what I want us to be able to see and I want us to be able to consider is the way that Ishmael and the way that Hagar may have felt their physical state their emotional state, when you get to a place that you are out of water and your circumstances feel unfair. How, what do you say we back up just a little bit this morning and understand a little better how they got to the place where they probably felt like it didn't make any sense? If I back up, I can start it like this. Abraham, we see that God has laid it on his heart, that he's going to give him a promised son. We know now by reading the word of God that that promised son was to be Isaac. Well, in the midst of this promise, God has allowed Abraham to share his thoughts and his vision and understanding what God's going to do with his wife. Sarah, when she gets the news, we know that Sarah laughs. I mean, at her old age, she has passed the cycle of life. She has already probably gone through menopause. I mean, it would be an absolute miracle at the age that she's at uh, to be able, like I said earlier, to, to hold the baby, let alone to give birth to a baby. Women of that age, if they could give birth, most of them would die in birth. And so now we realize that he has shared this thought with her, and she gets the idea. I guess I could say it casually and gets the bright idea. You know what I'll do? I'll, I'll combine Abraham, my husband, with Hagar, and she'll have me a son. I want you not to miss this now. She says in the Bible that she can have me a son. Sarah wanted a baby. She wasn't necessarily wanting Hagar 
to be the mother of the child and it be her child. She just wanted Sarah, or she just wanted Hagar to be a surrogate mother. You know what that means? I just want you to have the baby for me since I'm, you know, close to 100 years old here and I need some help here. I need you to help me and God out. That's what it sounds like to me. But the problem is, is that when the baby is born, Hagar doesn't see the baby as Sarah's child. She sees the baby like, this is my baby. This is my son right here. And so we've already got a conflict of interest. And they name that first son Ishmael. Soon, time begins to pass, and there's tension within the home. There is hard feelings, and there's tension within that household. To what degree, we can only speculate this morning. But God, after some time, that Isaac, uh, God blesses Sarah's womb, and she gives birth to now what was to be the promised son. Now you've got a 16, 17-year-old son. Uh, Isaac gets to the place that he's about three years old. There's possibly some mockery in the house, hard feelings, tension in the house. And Sarah has had all she can take. I'm tired of it. I can't deal with it no more. Something's got to change in this house because we can't keep going like this. And so what Sarah decides to do, she tells her husband, you got to get rid of her. She, her and that boy's got to go. I can't deal with it no more. And so Abraham, being the great father of faith, the great man of God, who God's hand was on, we saw that between him and Lot. You see, God shows Abraham what to do in a time when you probably wouldn't know what to do. You got two women that are against each other. You got two opposite poles, if you will, magnets if in the in the same house, and they're working in opposition. And so God speaks to Abraham and he says, I want you to do what your wife Sarah says to do. Well, that means I've got to get rid of my son. I've got to cast out this woman who is the mother of my child. You see, God gives Abraham a reassurance that everything's going to be okay. He says, I'm going to bless that son. He's your son. There's no doubt about that. And I'm going to bless him and make a great nation out of him. So I don't want to villainize Abraham because Abraham gone, went through this with an understanding that everything was going to be okay. He, was, he didn't have to worry. Whether he worried or not, I don't know. But he didn't have to because he had a reassurance from God that when this thing's over with, it's going to be all right. So I want you to see this morning as this thing begins to unfold. I want you to consider the physical and the mental state of what it might have felt like to be Hagar and Ishmael. Early in the morning, the Bible says that Abraham, not Sarah, not another concubine, not a, not a handmaid, not a slave, Abraham gets up in the morning. He goes and gathers some bread and a bottle of water. It must have been a personal thing because Sarah didn't want no part of it. Normally, historically, it would have been a common practice for the wife to be the one to go take care of those kinds of things, gather those things, and see her off. But apparently, it's so personal between Hagar and Sarah. Can you imagine being Hagar? And you get up that morning, and the man that you have known to be the father of your son she never asked for any of this. She never went to Sarah and said, hey, I'd like to sleep with your husband so I can have a baby for you. She never asked for that. But now here she is, Sister Rachel. This man, Abraham, the father of her, husband, the father of her son, he's gathering bread and water. And he comes to her and he takes the bottle of water and he slides it over her shoulder. I told you the Bible kind of sounds like it might have been Ishmael was a baby, but that's not the case. Study it for yourself. You'll find. And so he gives, he takes the, the child, Ishmael, and he brings Ishmael over there, and he sends them off with a bottle of water and some bread. They have lived under provision for the last 16 or 17 years of Ishmael's life, and now the only provision they have is bread and water. Is anyone feeling what I'm saying? 
I, I, can't, I can't even fathom what it must have felt like, the emptiness that she may have felt. Did she deserve it? I don't really know all of that. But here's what I want you to understand, folks. Our feelings are real whether we did it to ourselves or not. Come on and say amen. I've been saying this for, for years, but a person's perception is their reality. If you don't get it now, think about it later. It'll come to you. A person's perception is their reality. In other words, you may not be a thief, but if a person perceives you to be a thief, in their mind, their reality is you're a thief. You see what I'm saying? So in her mind, she sees it one way, and that does not negate that her feelings are still real. You could be hurt by somebody that you think did something that didn't, but your feelings are still real. Does anyone feel what I'm saying? You understand? And so early in the morning, he gets them together. He gives them a bottle of water and some bread. He doesn't put them on a camel. He doesn't put them on a donkey. He doesn't put them on a beast. They're on foot. Abraham was a man, a man of possessions, a man of things. He had stuff. Sister Danielle, he could have easily put him on a donkey and gave him a couple of pack mules to go along with him and said, here, here's a couple extra animals. Here, here, here's a rabbit we skinned yesterday. Take him and roast him on the fire when you get bread and water. Somebody else besides me, you read that and you think, I almost don't seem fair. Oh, Lord, help me preach this morning. You don't know where I'm going yet. No donkey. No camel on foot headed out into the wilderness, the unknown. Some may say, well, the reason why that he gave her a bottle of water and some bread was because maybe they were supposed to meet up at a checkpoint at some point where there would be another well. Maybe. But something happens. Something happens on that journey. But I want you to stop for a minute and I want you to listen to this. What if... You would have been Hagar. What would have gone through your mind if you would have been standing there watching him going and collecting, getting your son, getting bread and water, and saying, I, saying your last goodbyes? What would have been going through your mind if you would have been Hagar? You would have been Ishmael. Maybe you would have thought to yourself, Why do I got to leave? I didn't ask to be with, I didn't ask to lay down in the bed with you. I was told to do this. I mean, what do you expect out of me? I mean, I, I did what y'all wanted me to do, and you're basically casting me and my son out. Where are we going to live? How are we going to survive? What are we going to eat? How long will this bread last me? How long will the water last me? Will I be able to find a water hole before too long? Will I be able to find a well, a creek, a river? Will I, what, what am I going to do? History would tell us that the wilderness of Beersheba was a desert place. A desert. Like what we may call the Mojave Desert or the Arizona Desert. And during the major part of the year, it's extremely hot and it's extremely dry. And you're going to send me and you say you love your son, you're going to send us out there? you got to be joking me. What are we going to do? Will the water last? What do you do whenever you run out of water and you need it? Well, they got on that journey, and Sister Nora, a little ways into that journey, I don't know, some say maybe they got a little bit bewildered and dehydrated and they lost their bearings, I don't know, but they run out of water. The bottle is now empty. Not a Zephyr Hills bottle. Maybe a canteen canister-like container. But when you shake it, there's nothing left in it. The little boy, the 16, 17-year-old teenage boy, most likely he is suffering from dehydration. He's getting sick. And in the midst of everything that is going on, she cannot find a well. I'm preaching this morning on when the water runs out. 
when you're out of water, what do you do? So the Bible tells us, if you read the story, you'll find what I'm telling you is the truth. But this woman agonizes over the idea that she feels helpless. And somebody that's listening this morning, you have felt a sense of helplessness because it's out of your control. I can't fix it. I want to. I can't make it any better. So doing what most mothers might do, she walks over to a place. She tells her son basically to put him in the shadow of a shrub, probably to protect him from the heat. Then the Bible says that she goes about a bow shot away from the child. Well, I didn't know what a bow shot was. I've shot a few bows and arrows, but I didn't know what it was. That's about 50 yards. In other words, she goes about 150 feet away. That's a pretty good distance. Brother David, she goes about 150 feet away, and she probably crouches down somewhere, and she begins to sob and cry out to God. I don't understand this, God, but please don't let me see the death of my son. You know what she was saying? Let me die first. You know what she was saying? We're going to die. We are going to die. Please don't let me see him die. Anybody feel this woman's pain? And what, what is unique about the story is that even though that this woman is crying out to God and she's saying, Lord, don't let me see the death of my son and all of this, I was expecting the Bible, Sister Rachel, to say, God answered Hagar. But you better go back and read it again for yourself. This is why it's important to study God's Word and get it in here. Am I doing all right this morning? Because when you go back and you read it, it says, and God heard the voice of the, of the lad. Wait, 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 wait. What, what? Wait, wait a minute. This woman just said, God, please don't let me see the death of my son. But the Bible said, and there's a reason, and God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God had heard the voice of the lad where he is. Oh, Lord, help me preach this out this morning. He went on to say, arise, lift up that lad. In other words, get that boy up on his feet. Put your hands on that boy and stand him upright before me because that boy, I'm going to make him a great nation before God. Somebody say amen. But there's something very interesting and noteworthy that I don't want us to miss as a church. Hagar and the boy both are lifting up their voice. But it's not Hagar that God replies to. It is the lad. Why? Why did God respond to the cries of that boy, Ishmael? Why did he respond to him? And I'm going to tell you the reason why. Is God already had a special purpose and plan for Ishmael. And Ishmael was marked by God because he was the son of a regal father. He is the son of a, of a great man, a great father. Oh, Lord, help me preach this out. Here is a boy that as he's laying underneath that shrub, probably dehydrated on his dying bed, I don't know, he's not doing well, but maybe he was groaning. Sister Danielle, maybe he was saying, God, help me. I don't know what that boy was saying. We don't know. We just know that the Bible said that God heard the voice of the lad. This is where it gets good. How many of you call yourself a child of God? Let me see your hand. How many of you that call yourself a child of God, raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Come on. You are a child of God. Do you know what that means? You are the son. You are the daughter of a regal father. You are the son and you are the daughter of a great father. And here's what you need to understand. There are times that it will be in a place of your life that you have scarce provision. All you got is a 
bottle of water and all you got is a little bread. And there are going to be times that you get down to a place that it feels unfair because the bottle has got empty and nothing is making any sense. You've lost your bearings. It feels like you're going to die. You're in the middle of nowhere. I don't understand this. There's somebody I know that's listening to this right now that needs this desperately. You can't make sense of all of it. But child of God, you better step back because God has a plan for your life. God has not forgot about you. God knows the pain you suffer. God knows the hurt. He knows the healing you need. He knows the direction of your future. And God is not going to sit idly by when we cry. What does that mean, Pastor Myers? Well, the enemy would like for you, whether you're Ishmael or you're Isaac or you're any child of God, he wants you to just be quiet. You see, if God really loved you, you wouldn't be out here dehydrated underneath a shrub trying to keep from burning up in this heat. You wouldn't be out here with your mama 150 feet away dying on the other end of the spectrum. You wouldn't be where you're at if you were a man of God or a woman of God. I hate the devil. I said, I hate the devil. Boy, I do. But I'm going to tell you something about God. God already knew before they ever left with a bottle of water and a loaf of bread. God knew before they ever even stepped out on foot, not on camel, not on donkey, not with a pack mule. God knew when they headed out into that wilderness of Beersheba, things were going to get bad. But all it took, somebody say this with me, cry out. All it took was the crying out, the voice of that boy who had a regal father. Was Hagar not important? I believe Hagar was important. But Ishmael, God had already given a promise to Abraham. I'm going to make that boy. How, let, let, stop and let's ask ourselves a question. How can God let Ishmael die if he's already promised a few verses earlier, I'm going to make a great nation. You can't make a great nation out of a dead man. How's he going to do that? Because God already knew, I got this. God already knew it. I got this. You see, we don't always feel that way, though, in the moment. Now, do we? When you're in the hospital and your number's on your your meter and a monitor don't look right and test results don't look right. You don't always feel that way now, do you? But God's got it. And if I live, I gain, I, it's, it's gain. If I die, it's gain in Christ. But outside of that, God, if you're a child of God, you are marked by God. And there is a responsibility on your behalf. The devil wants you to just sit sheepish and quiet and never say anything. But the Lord says, look here. I responded to the voice of Ishmael, when he began to agonize in grief in the middle of the wilderness. I responded to that, and God will respond to your cry. Stop thinking that just because you haven't seen the answer yet, that God don't care and God's not listening to you. Sometimes the enemy will tell you, you're not a woman of God, you're not a man of God, you messed up somewhere, you did some, you couldn't possibly be. But you're either called and you're either his child or you're not. And if you're his child, when you cry, he will hear you. How many of you this morning said, I need a little bit of boost of confidence because here lately I've been praying and it almost feels like sometimes I feel like I'm wasting my breath. Because it didn't happen the way I thought it should. Or I thought it was going to go a different way. But God is still hearing the cry of that lad. Somebody give God praise this morning and say, thank you, Jesus. I don't want anybody that is here to ever underestimate the power of the cry. Let me tell you what will happen in the human flesh. Can I get down to just raw, just everyday us? Sometimes you get out and you pray and you almost feel like your prayer time. You may say the same thing over and over and you just feel like you're just kind of wasting your breath. And sometimes you pray and it just don't feel. I mean, it ain't like you were in revival and you felt the Holy Ghost come and you heard doves. Woo, and your wings are flapping. You just, it was just you and it felt like in the middle of nowhere. Just you in, in outer space. And you didn't feel nothing. 
So you get up from your prayer place, and the next opportunity you have to pray, pray, sometimes you approach prayer a little differently because God hadn't moved yet. And the more that time goes on, you'll start stop praying as much as you were praying. You'll stop praying as fervently as you were praying. When instead, the longer you lay underneath that shrub, Ishmael, the louder your cry ought to be. The longer you deal with it, the longer you dehydrate, the longer you need water, the, lo- the more you ought to lift up your voice. God, it's me again. Maybe, maybe it may seem redundant, but I need the same thing I needed yesterday. I need provision. I need your help. Somebody lift your hand and say, I'm going to believe God for it. Hallelujah. But the Bible says that during the midst of all of this, in verse number 19, and God opened up her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. I want, I want you to listen to me carefully and closely. So there are one or two things that happened here. Number one, either God just spoke a word or snapped his finger in a dugout well that takes hours and countless hundreds of hours of man labor to dig. God just spoke it and a well popped up. Or number two, somehow in the midst of everything going on, the well had been there the whole time. But through Hagar's distress, her dehydration, her anxiety and fear, she had already resigned her fate to death. Oh, I've been there. You've already, you've already committed yourself to the worst case scenario. I believe it's very possible there was a well, Sister Patricia, the whole time. She kind of lost her bearings in everything that was going on. So much going on. The stress of where we're going to live, how, what we're going to eat, how we're going to make it, who we're going to live with. All of that. And she traveled down that dusty desert area. And she started watching the water. Folks, a lot of people may forget to preach this. But she was the one with the water bottle. Somebody needs to hear this. She was the one watching the water bottle get empty. She was the one that knew if things keep going like this, we can't pay the bills. She was the one watching it, Sister Rhonda, day by day or hour by hour. Every time she passed the bottle to Ishmael, and got the bottle back in her hand, she was watching it getting more and more empty. I believe that all of that was taking its toll on her. Just like some of the junk we've been through is taking its toll on us. I'm going to tell you something. Until you've been through that mind battle, don't tell me. You start facing and fighting that junk and it gets in your mind and you start worrying and doubting and fearing and you're trying the best you can to have faith and not doubt and believe God, but the enemy steadily, well, look at the water bottle. Don't you forget. I mean, I know God is able, but he ain't done it yet. And that bottle, you ain't got but one more swig left in that bottle. You ain't got but one more. What you going to do then? But you see, she knew it. And I believe that Sister Miranda, as she watched that bottle get down to its very last drop, and she watched her son getting lethargic, and she felt weakness in her body as a mother, I believe it began to take a toll on her. And she began to look at that water bottle, look at herself, and look at her son, and look at her circumstances. And she resigned herself to the worst case scenario. You see, the difference is is that God spoke to Abraham back when and said, I'm going to make a nation out of that boy. But we don't know that God ever spoke or that Abraham relayed that message back to her. So as far as she knows, we're at the end of the road. And this is it. Could it be that the reason that sometimes we don't see the well and we have to have God open our eyes to see what's been there the whole time 
is because the circumstances, the numbers, the measurements, the reports, the diseases, the bills have gotten so bad that you can't see anything else but that. Am I, am I preaching all right? You can't see nothing else. You can't seem to grab a hold of an answer because all you see is problems, junk, strife, issues. Could it be that she lost her ability to see the well that was already there because she's in such a panic? She doesn't know there's water. She's already taken her son and said, sit down here in the shade. And she's already cried out, oh, God. And I believe within my heart that water was there. I've been there before when I allowed myself to get panicky, worried, thinking on the worst case scenario. And then God opens up your eyes and comes through. And you know you're embarrassed that you allowed yourself to get so wrapped up and tangled up with your circumstance. I didn't come here to condemn you for that. Sometimes that's through your own humanity. Everybody struggles differently. But I did come to tell you something this morning. And I want to try to close with this thought. God opened her eyes and he showed her the water the well, but it was her responsibility to get up, take her water bottle, and go fill it. I'm going to tell you, I preached a lot of services and a lot of messages in my time of preaching where that we came to the close of a service, the close of a message, and God showed people he opened their eyes and let them see that he is the well of living water. But they failed in a time of malnourishment, dehydration. They failed to get up out of their seat and make their way to the water to fill the bottle. If God does his part, Sister Randy, will you come play something for me? If God does his part and he opens your eyes to see the truth, his love, his mercy, his compassion, but in the end you fail to get up and fill that bottle full of the water, in the day of judgment, you won't be able to point your finger back at God and say, God, I didn't know. God, you didn't make a way. God, you didn't help me. Because the Lord, I believe, will remind you. Do you remember that Sunday morning, October the 3rd? 2021, you were going through a place of your life, and I opened up your eyes. But even still, you chose to lay there instead of getting up and going to fill the bottle. Not one of us know what tomorrow holds. It's been said a few times already in this service. But as the old saying goes, we know who holds tomorrow. And I believe the best thing we could do is put our lot in the hand of God and say, God, you know how this story is going to end. But I need you to give me some reassurance. My eyes are opened up. I see where I've made some mistakes and I've let myself get overwhelmed. Will you stand to your feet across the Lord's house? If God is loving and kind enough to send a message like this to help you to see where you have gone wrong and you have allowed yourself to get upset about things that God said are unnecessary, some of that worry and some of that's unnecessary because I've already got a plan and there's already water there. You've been so caught up with the details that you couldn't see the well. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder if there's anyone humble enough to admit that God was talking to you this morning and you'd like to come to this altar and pray. 
Greatest thing you could do in this service this morning is that when God opens up your eyes and He shows you the well, get up, get your bottle in your hand, and make your way down to the altar, the oasis that God has shown you. Some are coming this morning. What about you? Maybe you find yourself a place at your seat. If that's what you need to do, I encourage you right now to get down before the Lord and begin to pray and say, God, you knew I needed this today. I, I've been feeling within myself like a, it's over. You know, I, I feel like we, we don't have what we need to get through and get by. And I feel like it's over. But it ain't over until the Lord says it's over. And until then, ask God to open up your eyes. Maybe you've been seeing things completely different because your eyes, you've been walking with your eyes closed because you've been looking at the wrong details, the wrong facts. You've been looking at the wrong answers, the wrong remedies. He is the remedy this morning. Father in heaven, I love you, and I have done everything that I feel in my power and strength and mind to share your good word with these people. Whether in this service or whether online, I pray, God, that you will bless, strengthen, and fortify those that hear this message. God, to know that when we're out of water, it doesn't mean that we're out of options. If we can just cry out to you, we're reminded that there's power in the cry of a child who has a regal father. Abraham was a great father of many nations, but not accounted as the greatest father of all nations, our God Jehovah. Will you submit some things to him this morning? You've kind of gone off the rails. Maybe you'll let your mind go crazy on you, wondering and worrying about things. Maybe you've done some of the very same things that Pastor Myers has been guilty of. Oh, Lord God, help us all. In Jesus' name, touch your children, Lord. If you're not praying this morning, I encourage you to pray for your church family, your friends, your husbands, your wives. I'm your child. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. I've lived all these years for you. I've loved you. Surely I've failed in some areas of my life. But I, I love you with an everlasting love, Lord, and I want you to know that I desire your help, your touch, your grace. In my time of need, I desire the hand of the Lord on my mind. God, help me not to miss everything you've been trying to show me. Because in my, sometimes in my spiritual immaturity, I might be apt to do what I think is best in my flesh. When you're saying no, Hagar, you turned on the wrong road. No, Hagar, you should have stopped right there and turned and looked to your right. But instead, you walked a little too far, and now you can't see what it was I was trying to show you. If I was you this morning, I'd say, Lord, help me to lean completely on you as my compass. God, I see you as the navigation system of my life. Surely I have fouled things up way too many times by getting ahead of you, making decisions that were not of God. Out of fear or out of impulse, you decided to do something because you were scared that all of a sudden the plan God had for you, somehow or another he just changed his mind. And you made a big decision. Be careful. Be very careful. 
you can easily make an impulse decision based on a temporary circumstance in your life. You can make permanent decisions because of temporary circumstances. You need to know that you know without a doubt that it's God that gave you the direction you're headed. You need to know without a doubt that it's God that spoke to you and showed you what to do and how to do it, how to go about it. You need to know that you know that you know. Oh, Lord God, I'm asking you to strengthen them that remain. Fortify us, God, in our roots. Let our roots be deeper than they've ever been this morning and let us feel your divine love. I ask this in the name of Jesus, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father.